Hello everyone, in this video we'll be solving topic 4 problems for um, IB physics waves and this is HL paper 1 questions. Um, the first problem says, a particle performs simple harmonic oscillations. Which of the following quantities will be unaffected by a reduction in the amplitude of oscillations? Um, total energy. So we know that energy is directly proportional to amplitude squares. So the total energy will be affected, uh, maximum speed. So one way to think about um, this option is also think in terms of energies. So we know um, that oscillations have um, a maximum speed when kinetic energy is greatest. And when kinetic energy is greatest, is equal to total energy. And just as what we talk about, um, for option A. Total energy is directly proportional to amplitude squared, so this will also be affected. Uh, maximum acceleration. Um, because acceleration is linked to speed, um, this will also be affected. And another way to think about is you can also think about um, option C in term of equation. So we know that uh, acceleration, maximum acceleration, is going to be equal to amplitude multiplied by omega square, where omega is angular uh, velocity. So maximum acceleration will be affected. Um, period. Period is equal to 2, pi, 2 pi over f, where f is frequency. And this quantity is not affected. Um, so D is the answer. Which of the following graphs shows a variation with displacement x of speed v of a particle performing simple harmonic motion? Um, <clears throat> so, when the particle, um, not particle, oh yes, particle. So, when particle has a displacement of zero. So displacement is equal to zero. It has a maximum speed. So here it should have a maximum value here when displacement is zero. So C and B are not correct. And then I'm going to look at this value here. right? So when it has a maximum displacement, so maximum x, Velocity will be equal to zero. So the answer is D. Um, if you don't know this, please make sure you know the two conclusions we talk about here, because this is very important for simple harmonic motion. Um, and if you don't understand this, you can think about the conclusion in terms of a spring mass system. A spring mass system. When reaching is maximum, displacement here, um, it has a velocity of zero. And when has a when the system has a displacement um, of zero, it has maximum displacement. Oh, sorry, it has maximum velocity. And this is because um, potential energy or a uh, spring energy in this case is equal to zero. So the total energy is equal to total kin maximum kinetic energy. Uh, maximum kinetic energy means maximum speed, right? So this is how you can remember this. And when the mass is at, um, is maximum or minimum displacement, you know that it has maximum potential energy and zero kinetic energy. So this tells us velocity is going to be equal to zero. This is how um, you can understand and comprehend this question here. A traveling wave of period 1.5 millisecond travels along a stretch spring at a speed of 40 meter per second. Two points on the string are 0.05 meter apart. 
What is the phase difference between two points? So here we know the period, um, but we have to be careful with the unit here. So period is going to be equal to 5.0 millisecond, and I am going to convert this to second. So it's going to be equal to 5 multiplied by 10 with a power of negative 3 second. And it has a speed of 40 meter per second. And it asks us to calculate the phase difference. Um, so when calculating phase difference, uh, think about wavelengths. And because uh, period pure is going to be equal to 1 over frequency, we can calculate frequency, which is equal to 1 over period. So 1 over 5 multiplied by 10 with the power of negative 3 is going to be equal to 0 0.2 multiplied by 10 to the third power. Um, this is equal to 200 hertz. Uh, and we know that wavelength is equal to velocity divided by frequency, which is equal to 40 divided by 200. So this is equal to 1 over 5. So this is telling us um, the distance between the two points is equal to 1 over 5 wavelengths. And 1 wavelength uh, is equal to 2 pi when we talk about the phase difference. Oh, sorry, sorry. Here is four. Is four here? Is four. So, the phase difference in term of pi uh, will be equal to one over four multiplied by two pi, which is equal to pi over two. So the answer will be um, B, and this is. Page one. Actually, let me change a color. End of page one. Um, by the way, if you recommend any software for solving problems, um, please post your recommendation um, on the comment section because currently I'm using OneNote, which is good, but sometimes uh, not very convenient. Diagram A represents equally spaced bees on a, sp on a spring. So bees are one centimeter apart. A longitudinal wave propagates along the spring. Diagram 2 shows the position of the bees at a particular instance. Which of the following is the best estimate of the wavelengths? Um, so this is a very typical graphical problem for topic four. Um, sometimes they ask you to calculate wavelengths. Sometimes they ask you to calculate the amplitude. So I will go through both of quantities in this problem. So first of all, for a section like this, you should know that this is going to be a compression. Because you can see that points are squeezed together, they become um, denser. And for section like here, it's going to be a refraction. Because points become more farther away from each other. Um, this problem asks us to calculate wavelengths. And we know that um, wavelengths is equal to the distance. The distance between um, two neighborhoods or two consecutive two consecutive uh, compression center or refraction center. So for this problem, you only need to identify the center of refraction or the center of compression. And I am going to go with compression. So here um, is a refraction. And here is also a refraction. And I am choosing this point because 1, 2, 3, this is the third point. 1, 2, 3, this is the third point. Um, so what's the distance between the two points? So here it tells us 1 centimeter for each large space. 
So this is gonna be the first meter, second meter, two meter, three meter, four meter, five, six, seven, and eight. So the answer for this problem will be eight. And for amplitude, uh, what you're gonna do is you're also gonna identify a center of compression or a center of refraction. And then you are gonna compare um, the distance between the center of compression and uh, sorry not the center of compression um so let me erase this so if you want to find amplitude um what you're gonna do is you are gonna identify direction of each point and then um you are gonna compare the space between this current position to the points initial position and this distance is going to be equal to amplitude um, i think this paper contain a problem between uh, a problem about amplitude and i am going to show the detailed step of how to find amplitude from diagrams the wavelength of a standing wave is equal to what so the wavelength of a standing wave is equal to twice the distance between adjacent nodes. So this is a standing wave. I apologize for my horrible drawing. And here will be a node. Here is another node. And here will be a anti node. So the distance between two consecutive nodes are equal to half of the wavelength. So wavelength is equal to twice the distance between adjacent nodes. On polarized lines is incident on the surface of a transparent medium. The reflected light is completely plane polarized. Um, the refracted light will be what? So when you see the term completely plane polarized, think about the Brewster angle. The Brewster's angle. Um, so the refracted light for the Brewster angle will only be partially plane polarized. Right. Uh, in fact, if you search a picture, you will probably see something like this. So this is the boundary between two medium. And this is the normal line. Here is going to be the angle of incidence. And this is the reflected light. And then you're gonna see different points on uh, here, different points. And you are also gonna see arrow to show that they are not polarized yet. And for the reflected, reflected light, you are not gonna see anything except for a line representing the direction of reflection. However, for refraction, so here is for refraction, you're gonna see points with arrow. And this arrow shows that refracted lights, refracted light is only slightly polarized. Um, so the answer is B for this problem. Uh, and this is page two, the end of page two. Property of waves are diffraction, polarization, diffraction, and refraction. Which of this is property applied to sound waves? Um, so sound wave is a longitudinal wave. 
So polarization will not occur to sound waves because it does not apply to longitudinal waves. They only apply to um, transverse wave. That's why we, we always say uh, electromagnetic waves are polarized. So um, the answer for this problem will be C. A standing wave is set up on a string at a particular frequency as shown. How many notes will be on the string if the frequency is double but nothing else is changed? So if frequency is double, uh, the period will be divided by two, which means that period is reduced. Uh, and this is because a period is equal to one over frequency. And now um, period is divided by two because frequency is multiplied by two. This means that initially here, they need a half period to pass this point, this node here. But now because the period is divided by two, they will look something like this. Right. The amount of time it needs to pass this point here is reduced by a factor of two. And then it looks something like this. And we will count how many no nodes are here. Uh, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the answer will be C. Light is incident from air on the surface of a transparent medium. When V is equal to the Brewster angle, which angle is equal to 19 degree? So this is the definition of the Brewster angle. X and Y is going to be equal to 19 degree. The sum of X and Y, I mean. So the answer is C. So let me do a quick review because there are more problem about the Brewster angle. And this is frequently tested. So this is the boundary between two mediums. And this is the normal line. This is the angle of incidence. And this is the reflected, reflected light, which has a equal angle, uh, theta sub i. And then there will be a light that's ref refracted. So for the Brewster angle, the first thing you need to know is that the angle here is going to be equal to 19 degree. So this is a right triangle. And here will be equal to 19 degrees minus theta sub i. And after doing mathematics, you will see that tangent incidence angle is going to be equal to um, medium n2 over n1. This is n2, this is n1. And you can also prove this uh, just using simple trigonometry. So we know that n1 minus sine theta 1 is equal to n2 minus sine theta 2, which is equal to n2 sine 19 degrees mi minus theta 1. And this is equal to n2 cosine theta 1. From this, you can see that tangent theta 1 is equal to n2 over n1. So this conclusion here, uh, the right angle here, and here is completely plan polarized for uh, refracted light. And here is slightly polarized for refracted light. Sorry, here is reflected light. And here is refracted light. So here are four points you need to know. This equation here, uh, the reflected light is completely plan polarized. The right angle here. And refracted light is 
only partially polarized. Unpolarized light is shown is shining through two identical polarizer whose axes are parallel. The ratio of I over I sub zero is equal to what? Um, so for unpolarized light, whenever it passing through a polarizer, it doesn't matter uh, the polarizer's axis. It doesn't matter which direction the polarizer wants to polarize the light. The intensity will always be equal to a half multiply by the initial intensity I sub zero here. And after the light is polarized, when it passes through polarizer two, the final intensity is gonna be um, this intensity here, multiply cosine theta square, where theta is the angle between uh, those polarizers axis and here because it says it's parallel um, cosine theta is equal to one so this is gonna be equal to a half i sub zero so we can calculate the ratio now this is gonna be equal to uh, a half i sub zero over a half which is equal to a half and this is equal to 50 percent so the answer is B. Um, just memorize whenever a unpolarized um, light, unpolarized um, light, passing through a polarizer, it always gonna have a intensity of a half multiply by its initial um, intensity, and when a polarized light passing through a polarizer, so polarized. Oh my gosh, I. My horrible handwriting. So let me write it here. It's for a um, polarized light. Um, polarized. When passing through a polarizer. Right, passing through is a polarizer. Intensity, final intensity, I, is equal to a half I sub zero, where this is the initial intensity. And when a polarized light, when polarized light passes through a polarizer, So assuming this is the axis and this is the angle between, the final intensity is going to be equal to this. Right. So memorize those two equations, they are super helpful when you are solving problems. And let's move on to the next problem. Um, so this is the end of page 3. The phenomenon of diffraction is associated with sound waves only, light waves only, water waves only, all waves. The answer is D. Diffraction is a property shared by all waves. Um, so this is a very common property shared by all waves. A standing sound wave is set up uh, inside a narrow glass tube, which has both ends open. The first harmonic frequency of the standing wave is 500 Hz. What is the frequency of the sound wave if the length of the tube is divided by 2 and one end is closed? Um, so if both ends are closed, both closed or open, Their frequency is gonna be equal to two L most divided by n. L is the length, and n refers to the harmonic frequency number 
Um, so n is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So for the first harmonic uh, wavelength, n is equal to 1 if both, uh, both ends are closed or both ends are open. And n is equal to 2 for the second harmonic frequency. However, if only one end is closed or open, um, is slightly different. So frequency is equal to 2L divided by 4N. Uh, and here N is different. N is going to be equal to 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on. So here um, we can use those equations to help us. So what is the frequency if the length of the tube is divided by 2 and 1 in is closed. So initially, this frequency here is equal to 500 hertz when both ends are open. Uh, this tells us that frequency is equal to velocity divided by wavelength, which is equal to V multiplied by N divided by 2L. And for the first harmonic frequency, N is equal to 1. So this is equal to V divided by 2L, which is equal to 500. And afterwards, then it has changed. So this final frequency here, uh, we know that is bosons are, one end is, cl is close. So it's going to be the, f the wavelengths, the frequency. Let me do it step by step. So f frequency is equal to uh, velocity divided by uh, frequency, which is equal to V multiplied by N divided by 4L here. And here it tells us that the length of the tube is divided by 2. So it's going to be equal to V multiplied by 4 multiplied by L divided by 2, which is equal to um, V divided by 2L. So it's going to give us the same answer of 500 hertz. I know this sounds uh, complex, but uh, after knowing those equations, it's not that hard. And I am doing this step by step, so hopefully this helps. A standing wave is established in air in pipe with one end closed, one closed, and one open end. The air molecule near X is R what? Um, always at the center of compression, always at the center of refraction. Sometime at the end of compression and sometime at the end of refraction. Never at the end of compression or refraction. Um, so this, you need to think about the definition of standing wave, a standing wave. So the answer is C. Um, this is because um, it changes, right? We know standing wave is formed when two waves with equal frequency are added up together according to the law of superposition. Um, this causes the node, their nodes to remain unchanged, while this wave here oscillates. So when it, and it oscillates vertically, so when the waves are like this, right? Here is gonna be a center of compression. However, if the wave is like this, then the node here will be a center of refraction. So sometime at the center of compression and sometime at the center of refraction. And the reason why here is a compression is this. So I'm going to do a quick explanation. So this is the displacement axis and this is time. At this point here, um, here, 
for this region above the x axis, uh, I'm gonna say is positive displacement, and um, positive displacement is rightward direction. I'm gonna define positive direction with rightward direction. And for region below the x-axis um, has a uh, region, the region below x-axis has a negative displacement. And I am going to say um, negative displacement means right leftward. So here is going to be something like this. And positive displacement has a rightward direction. So you can see that arrow has opposite direction, which refers to compression. And here I'm going to do the same thing. Oh, my horrible dry. So here is displacement and here is time. So here, because it has a negative direction, I'm going to say um, it travels to the left direction. And here, because it has a positive direction, I'm going to say it travels to the right direction. And two arrows are pointing in the opposite direction. So this is a center of refraction. And this is why the answer for this problem is C. Horizontally polarized light is transmitted through a polarizer whose transmission axis is horizontal. The light enters a container with a sugar solution and is then incident on a second polarizer whose transmission axis is vertical. When the second polarizer is rotated by a small angle, no light is transmitted through the second polarizer. The, the explanation for this observation is that the, the sugar solution causes destructive interference. Mm. Notice the plan of polarization of light can only transmit vertically polarized light or refract light so no light is incident on the second polarizer. Mm. So, if it causes destructive interference, it won't cause all light not to be transmitted through the second polarizer, and not to transmit it to the second polarizer. And because, you know, initially there are, um, the ax axis here is vertical, and here is, uh, here is horizontal, so the intensity here will be equal to zero because cosine 19 degree is equal to zero. So it means that this problem is eventually saying that no light passes through the second polarizer. And the problem here is about the sugar solution. So after going to the sugar solution, no light passes through. And the only explanation here is that all lights are polarized in this region. So the answer will be B, rotates the plan of polarization of light. Horizontally polarized light is transmitted through a polarizer whose transmission axis is horizontal. The light enters a container with a sugar solution and is then incident on the second polarizer, polarizer whose transmission axis is vertical. When the second polarizer is rotated by a small angle, no light is transmitted through the second polarizer. The explanation for this observation is that the sugar solution do what? Um, causes destructive interference, rotates the plan of polarization of light, can only transmit vertically polarized light, refracts light so no light is incident on the second polarizer.
So we know initially this axis here is vertical. So intensity here will be equal to zero because cosine 19 degree is zero. However, after rotating this axis, there should be some intensity. So the problem here is that no light passes through. When light passes through the sugar solution, intensity is affected, right? So what's the explanation for this? So to have an intensity of zero, to have an intensity of zero, the axis can only be equal to 19 degree. Um, so the angle between the lights, the polarized light here, and the axis gotta be equal to 19 degree to have a intensity of zero. This means that the sugar solution here changes the direction the direction of the polarized light. So theta is equal to 19 degree. And uh, this is B. Um, it, the sugar solution rotates the plane of the of polarization of light. A um, polarized light of intensity I sub zero is incident on a polarizer with a vertical transmission axis. The transmitted light is incident on a sheet of material X. After transmit transmission through X. The intensity of light is I sub zero over two. It is suggested that the light could be uh, a polarizer with vertical transmission axis, a polarizer with horizontal transmission axis, non polarizing glass. So initially, this unpolarized light is here, and after passing through. Uh, the first polarizer is going to be equal to I sub zero, which is equal to the final intensity here. This means that uh, the angle between them is equal to zero degree, where you can say that transmission axes are parallel. So axes are parallel. So here, axes are parallel. And this will be a vertical transmission axis. So this is right. The first one is right. The second one says has a horizontal transmission axis. Then theta, the angle between axes, will be equal to 19 degree. And cosine 19 degree is equal to zero. So this is wrong. A non-polarizing glass, this is also possible because then you are not polarizing any light and the intensity remain unchanged unchanged so a is the answer this is page six The lowest frequency emitted by a orange pipe does is open at both and is off. Um, what is the lowest frequency emitted by a orange pipe of the same length that is closed at one end? Um, so this is very similar to a problem we solved in the previous part of the video. So when it is open at when it is open at both end, wavelength is equal to. Um, 2 multiplied by length divided by n. Uh, and when it is closed at one end, wavelength is equal to 2L divided by 4N, right? Where N is equal to 1, 3, 5, 7. 
and here n is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So what is the lowest frequency? So the initial frequency is equal to velocity divided by wavelength, which is equal to Vn divided by 2L. And because it is the lowest frequency, we, n is going to be equal to 1, which is equal to 1 over 2L. And here, for this uh, for this frequency here, when the pipe is closed at one end, frequency is going to be equal to, I'm going to call this f sub 2, it's going to be equal to 4vn divided by 2l. And for low, lowest frequency, n is equal to 1. So this is equal to 4n divided by 2l, which is equal to uh, v divided by l. So this is equal to a half multiplied by f. So the answer is b. Uh, make sure you know those two formula here. They are very important, and the two formulas here are not in the data booklet, I think. So please memorize um, the two equations here. A point source of light of amplitude a sub zero gives rise to a particular light intense light intensity when viewed at a distance from the source. When the amplitude is increased and the viewing distance is double, the light intensity is double. What is the new amplitude of the source? Um, so this problem eventually is testing about the inverse square law. So intensity is directly proportional 1 over r, 1 over r where r uh, is the distance between the point source and the, and the object that we care about. And intensity is also directly proportional to amplitude square. Um, so R is the viewing distance in this problem. When viewing distance is double, 1 over R square will be divided by 4. Right. So viewing distance. When wing distance r is multiplied by 2, 1 over r squared is divided by 4. Okay. So the intensity will be equal to 1 over 4 multiplied by i is initial intensity. Um, so to have what is the amplitude for this problem. Oh, and the intensity is double. However, the, in the intensity is double. So we have 2i, and this is going to be equal to 1 over 4i multiplied by 8. So the final amplitude square is going to be equal to a multiplied by the initial amplitude square. Um, this is because you, you multiply um, 1 over 4i by 8. And when you increase the intensity by 8, it means the amplitude square is um, multiplied by a or increased by a factor of a, since intensity is directly proportional to amplitude square. And now we can calculate amplitude square. It's not amplitude square, sorry. Um, final amplitude. So this is going to be equal to 1 multiplied by the square root of 2 multiplied by the initial intensity. So the answer is B. A unpolarized ray of light in air is incident on the surface of water. The ray is complete, the reflected ray is completely polarized. Um, this is the key term, and we talk about this um, in previous part of the video. When you see the term completely polarized, think about the Brewster angle. 
which of the following are separated by a angle of 19 degree um, so if you think about the Brookster angle you should be able to answer this question if you know the basic concept of the Brewster angle. Um, so let me draw a diagram again. This is the normal line. This is the angle of incidence. This is the angle um, of the reflected light, which has a equal angle. Uh, theta sub i and this is the refracted light and Brewster's uh, sorry the Brewster angle this angle here is gonna be equal to 19 degree so the angle between the incidence ray and the refracted ray this is not right because two incidence angle to multiply by uh, the angle of incidence might not be equal to 19 degree or doesn't have to equal to 19 degree um, B is the answer because this is the reflected light and this is the refracted light progressive waves S and T have the same frequency and are in the same medium as has a amplitude of um, two centimeter and t has a amplitude of four meter what is the ratio of the intensity of t to the intensity of s um, so this is again testing about the inverse square law we know that intensity is directly proportional to amplitude squared Right, so the intensity of T so intensity of T over intensity of S the ratio is gonna be equal to um, their amplitude squared ratio so A sub T squared over A sub S squared which is equal to uh, 4 squared, 16, divided by 2 squared, which is equal to 4. So this is equal to 4. 16 divided by 4 is equal to 4. So the answer is D. And this is the end of page 6. Which of the following is a correct com comparison between standing waves and traveling waves? Mm -hmm. Wave amplitude is constant for all points along the wave for standing waves. Um, this is wrong, because for standing wave, you, the amplitude is not constant. And this is linked to the basic concept of standing waves. Um, standing waves are formed when two waves travel in the opposite direction and with the same frequency add up according to the law of superposition. Um, so because of interference, each point have a different wave amplitude, so A is wrong. And for traveling wave, they have constant amplitude. This is a great question because it helps us to review characteristic of standing waves, which is mm -hmm frequently tested. So for a transverse wave, it has constant amplitude. For standing waves, it has inconstant amplitude. Energy is always transferred, always is not transferred. This is also wrong. Um, for standing wave, there is no energy transfer. And this is because uh standing waves are uh, standing waves are formed when two waves travel in the opposite direction add up add up and because they travel in different direction their direction of energy transfer is different so there is no energy transfer for standing waves and tra traveling waves they transfer energy 
transfer energy. So this is wrong. The wavelength is twice the distance between consecutive nodes. This is correct. We talk about this. This is node. This is nodes. Right. Here is here is a node. Here is another node. So twice the distance, you will have a wavelength. So this is correct. This is also correct. This is the definition of wavelengths for traveling waves. So the answer is C. Phase varies continuously along the wave. Oh, standing wave has a constant phase. Constant phase difference. Right. So D is wrong. And this, um, to be more specific, so this is a, I know I spent a lot of time in this problem, but um, this is a opportunity to review if you are unfamiliar about this problem. For standing waves, when they travel in two consecutive nodes, right, two consecutive nodes, They have the same wave phase difference. And for um, two neighborhoods, no. So, so what I'm talking about is this area. And this area. So two neighborhoods. So neighborhood pairs, let me call it pairs, they are out of phase, which means the velocity direction is opposite. And this tell, this tell us that this two pair here they are in phase, right? And those two things here are out of phase. So this is just a quick review about standing wave. Diagram represent equally spaced bees on a spring. The bees are one centimeter apart. A longitudinal wave propagates along the spring. Diagram two shows the position of the bees at a particular instant. Which of the following is the best estimate of the amplitude? So this is also a, a very typical question and is hard because many people have the wrong answer. So again, identify this is the center of compression. So this is compression. And this means that this point gonna oscillate in this direction. It's gonna oscillate in the opposite direction, sorry, in the positive direction. And this point here will oscillate uh, in the negative direction and here also positive direction and here is the negative direction and here seems another point of refraction so you can draw a wave from those points something like this So we want to find amplitude, and we know for longitudinal wave, they uh, the direction of velocity, um, 
is parallel to the direction of uh, the, the direction of oscillation. So amplitude is just equal to the distance between this point here. And this point. This is the amplitude. So this is gonna be equal to 0 0.8 centimeter. So this is the answer for um, this problem. A string stretched between two fixed point songs is second a harmonic f frequency f. Which expression wherein is an integer gives the frequency of harmonic that have a node at the center of the of the string? So because it has two fixed points, we know that frequency is equal to velocity divided by wavelength which is equal to V multiplied by N divided by 2L. And because it's at the second harmonics, N is equal to 2. So this is equal to um, V divided by L. And now we want to find the, the frequency of the harmonics at the center of the string. So how do we do this problem? So I'm gonna write f n. So this is gonna be equal to we divided we multiply by n. Uh, multiply by two, multiply by l. And because um, we want to find the frequency of harmonic that has a node at the center of the of the string, I'm gonna divide the length by l. So this is equal to v divided by l, which is equal to frequency multiplied by n. So b is the answer. Oh, you can also divide n by 2. It doesn't really matter because um, you can see things from different perspectives. Um, you can think that we cut the 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 links, right? We cut the links to two equal parts, or you can simply divide n by two. In two separate experiments, a monochromatic light is incident on a single slit. The diagram shows the diffraction pattern obtained on a screen far from the slit. In the top of the diagram. The wavelength of light is uh, lambda sub 1, and sleeve width is b sub y. The bottom diagram, in the bottom diagram, the wavelength of light is lambda sub 2, and the slit waves width is b sub 2. In each experiment, the distance between the slit and the screen is the same. Which of the following uh, may be deduced? Um, so we can see that for the bottom diagram, fringe spacing increases. So fringe spacing increases, right? Um, so I'm going to say y sub 1 is less than 1 sub 2. And now you can just use the equation for fringe spacing. Uh, so fringe spacing is equal to what? Um, this is a single slit. Um, I think for single slit, fringe spacing is approximate by wavelengths divided by b sub 1, which is slit width. So this is less than this. So the answer is A. If you don't remember this equation, you can also deduce that. So this is... A is the distance between, this is the distance here, this is the slit width, and this is the place where 
the diffraction pattern and interference are shown. So we are going to have a angle theta here, and we are going to have distant d. So this is the fringe spacing y. So d tangent theta. So d tangent theta can be approximate into d theta since theta is very small. It's going to be equal to y. And we know that a sine theta, uh, if you draw a line, you will see y. So this is the path difference. Uh, and here you can draw a right triangle. I'm not going to go through um, detailed steps, um, but you can do this. You should see this when I draw this, right? This is the path difference and there is a right triangle and using um, basic trigonometry you will see that a sine theta is equal to and multiplied by lambda um, this is also a equation you should learn in this topic um, and because we are finding the distance here and here which means that m is equal to one so lambda is equal to 1, and you can use the same approximation, sine theta is equal to theta, is equal to theta. So sine, oh sorry, theta is equal to lambda divided by 2. And substitute this into this equation, we have d lambda divided by a is equal to y. And in this problem, they have equal distance, I think. So when dy, sorry, y1 is less than y2, it means that d lambda 1 divided by a sub 1, which is b sub 1 in this problem, is a b sub 1. Sorry. d lambda 1, b sub 1 is less than d lambda, lambda 2 divided by b sub 2, which gives you the answer of a. Um, the next problem, a optically active substance is a substance that rotates the plane of polarization of the incident polarized line. So this is just a definition that you need to know. Water is draining from a vertical tube that was initially full. A vibrating tying tube is held near the top of the tube. For two position of the water surface only, the sun is at its maximum loudness. The distance between the two positions of maximum loudness is x. What is the wavelength of the sun emitted by the fork? Um, so how do we do this problem? So we know that the water is initially full. So when the water is initially full, it looks like a, uh, a it looks like a pipe that has one closed end, and the closed end refers to the surface of water, which is this, right? And when the water here disappear, it, 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 it regains a length of x. And then what happened is another maximum loudness appear, which tell us here is gonna have a node and this will look something like this from this we can say we can see that this thing here is equal to a half lambda which has a length of x so x is equal to lambda over 2 so lambda is gonna be equal to 2x so the answer will be D. Um, the tricky part here is this part. 
um, some people might draw a diagram like this. Right, and this will give you the wrong answer. So this is wrong. Because the water is initially full. Initially full. So here looks something like this. Which of the following gives the region of the electromagnetic spectrum in the order of decreasing frequency? Um, so for a EM spectrum, you have radio wave, microwave, and then you have um, infrared, I think visible gamma ray and x-ray so in this from radio wave to x-ray frequency increases energy increases and wavelength decreases. So the answer for this problem is C. An invisible light has a um, has a wavelength of three hundred fifty nanometer to seven hundred nanometer. I think this is the approximate rate. Uh, Oh, you need to, by the way, you need to memorize this picture here. Um, this is the basic picture you need to memorize. And this is not in the data booklet. A ray of light passes from the air into a long glass plate of refractive index N at an angle theta to the edge of the plate. The ray is incident on the internal surface of the glass plate and the refractive ray travels along the external surface of the plate. What change to N and what change to theta will cause the ray to tra travel entirely within the plate after incidence? Um, so when the ray is here, when the ray is here, this is a total internal reflection. And this only occur when the ray travel from a medium with a lower refractive index to a medium with a higher refractive index. So the medium here is air, which has a refractive index of one. And the refractive index of glass is N. So um, for ray to travel entirely within the play after the incidence, we know that in air, N sub air is less than N. Um, to travel entirely within the play, we want to increase the difference between their refractive index. So we want to increase the value of N here. So C and D are not correct. And for the angle theta, we can think about the Snell law. So this angle here is going to be equal to 19 degree minus theta. And this, I'm going to say, is equal to theta 2. And this angle here is also equal to this angle here, since these two lines are parallel. So by using the Snell law, we know that the refractive index of air multiplied by the angle of incidence is going to be equal to uh, refractive index of the glass plate multiplied by the refractive angle theta 2 here. So 1 multiplied by sine 19 degree minus theta is equal to uh, n multiplied by sine theta 1. Um, and to travel entirely within the plate after the incidence, we want theta 2 to decrease. So this angle here are larger. 
so the line control entirely within the play. So theta one minus if theta one minus n sine theta one minus so the right side of the equation minus. Um, as a result, the left the left side of the equation also minus. So sine nineteen degree minus theta minus. This tells us that nineteen degree minus theta decreases, and this only occur when the value of theta increases. So A is the answer. The air in pipe of links L and open at both ends vibrate with a fundamental frequency F. What is the fundamental frequency of a pipe of length 1.5 L and closed at one end? So when the pipe is open at both ends, frequency is equal to velocity divided by wavelength, which is equal to Vn divided by 2L. And when the pipe is closed at one end, frequency F sub 2 is equal to velocity divided by lambda sub 2, which is equal to uh, Vn over 4L. Not 4L, sorry. 4 multiplied by the length of the pipe, which is equal to 1.5 L. And this is equal to Vn over 6 L, which is equal to 1 third multiplied by Vn over 2 L. And we know that this part is equal to frequency F. So the answer will be 1 third F, which is A here. Um, so the important thing about this problem is you need to be familiar with sorry, those two equations. Lambda is equal to 2L over N. Lambda is equal to 4L over N. This apply when the pipe is open or closed, closed at one end. And this equation apply when the pipe is open or closed at both end. At both ends. A standing wave of frequency F is established in air in a pipe open at one end. So when you see open at one end, you should immediately react with um, the equation that wavelength is equal to uh, 4L divided by N. So frequency is equal to V multiplied by N divided by 4L, where N uh, is equal to 1, 3, 5, 7 for this equation here. What is the frequency of the next highest harmonic? Um, so the picture here is the first harmonic. Uh, so n is equal to 1. And for the next highest harmonics, n is equal to 3. So av is going to be equal to v multiplied by 3 divided by 4l which is equal to 3 multiplied by v over 4l. And this v over 3l means that n is equal to 1, right? n is equal to 1. And this is the first harmonic. This is the equation for first harmonic. Uh, so the answer will be 3f. So here, sorry, let me write it here, f sub 3, f sub 2, because it's the second harmonic. So the answer is D. A transverse standing wave is established on a string. Consider the following phase difference. Which of the following give all possible phase difference between the oscillation of any two particles on the standing wave? So when it has an um, angle of zero degree, they're completely in phase. And when having this um, is half some time, it has a phase difference of pi over 4. And for a 180 degree, they are completely out of phase. Great. So in phase is something like this. And out of phase is something like 
this. And there is another. And this two scenario will give you um, all possible phase difference between oscillation of two any particle because they cover all situations. So the answer is B. Um, by the way, this is this problem is the last problem of page nine. This is page nine. And this and this is the um, last problem of page nine. This is the last problem of page nine. Oh, sorry, this is the last problem of page 10. <laughs> the diagram shows four different pipes drawn to a scale. Sending wave in the fundamental or first harmonic mode are set up inside each pipe. Which pipe produces a fundamental note with the lowest frequency? Um, so again, there are two equations to calculate frequency. The first one is frequency is equal to uh, V multiplied by N divided by 2L. And when, uh, when we are thinking about the first harmonic, N is equal to 1. So this is going to be equal to 1 over 2L. This applies when the pipe is open or closed at both ends. So I'm just going to write both ends, close or open. And another equation we have is half is equal to Vn divided by 4L. Um, and for the first harmonic, N is equal to 1. So frequency is equal to V divided by 4L. And this apply when it's closed or open at one end. So to have the smallest frequency or, or lowest lowest frequency, we want to use this equation here because V divided by 2L is clearly larger than V divided by 4L. This tells us the, the pipe should be closed or open at one end only. So A and D are not correct. And now we have two pi of different lengths. For the frequency to be the lowest, we want 4L to be largest, which means that we want lengths to be largest. So the answer here will be C, since the length of C is uh, larger than the length of B. The graph shows the vibration with position as of the displacement x of a wave undergoing simple harmonic motion. What is the magnitude of the velocity at displacement x, y, and z? Um, so although the graph looks sort of like complicated, when you see a displacement versus uh, versus time graph, you should immediately wrap with that's a gradient is velocity. And when you see the uh, graph of that shows the variation with position s of the displacement x for a mass spring system, um, you should be aware that uh, when displacement is a, is maximum value, so having maximum displacement. Maximum displacement. And I am using the magnitude when I say maximum displacement because I don't want to consider a um, positive or negative value here. Velocity, or actually speed, to be more accurate, is equal to zero meter per second. And when displacement is equal to zero, um, you are having maximum speed, V max. So here we can see that X is as is at the maximum displacement because is as far as from the equilibrium position. So X 
the magnitude of velocity is going to be equal to 0 meter per second. And x and z, um, the displacement from the equilibrium position is equal to 0, which means that those two points are um, at the equilibrium position. So they should be having maximum speed. So the only correct answer will be B. Um, and those two are very helpful conclusion for you to understand. The diagram shows the fundamental of uh, the fundamental or first harmonic of a standing wave in the pipe that's open at one end. At any instant, um, all molecules of air in the pipe oscillate with the same um, the same phase. So this problem is eventually testing about property of standing waves. And I think we have talked about this in the previous part of the video when there's a problem about comparing standing wave and transverse wave. So for a standing wave, they have um, in constant, in constant amplitude. And there is no energy transfer. Um, but they have the same phase difference. And from this, you know that A is the answer. Uh, and just to be a little bit more specific, when traveling within something like this, when traveling within this part, all points are in phase. And when traveling within something like this, those two part are out of phase, right? Are out of phase. So those two are out of phase, and those two are in phase. In another word, two neighborhood pair. Two neighborhood pairs are out of phase. A standing wave is established on a string between two fixed point. What is the phase difference in radian between point P and point Q on the string? Well, so we just talk about this. Look at the picture here. We talk about that for a standing wave, two neighborhood, two neighborhood pairs are out of phase. Right. Auto phase means that they are going to have a wavelength of a lambda over 2. And we know lambda in terms of pi is equal to 2 pi. So 2 pi over pi is equal to pi. So the answer is C. If the problem changes to, changes to something like this, if here is another point, Q prime, then P and Q are in phase. So they're going to have a phase difference of zero degree. Well, or you can say that they have a phase difference of one wavelength. And the answer will be D. And I think for in phase, A works as well. Because there is no phase difference. Um, let's look at the next problem, and this is the end of page 12. The diagram shows a simple harmonic standing wave on a string fixed at both ends. What is the phase difference between 
um, what is the phase difference in radian between particle at x and the particle at y. Um, again, this is testing about basic property of a of standing waves. When standing waves looks like this neighborhood pairs are out of phase. And to be more specific, um, two consecutive neighborhoods pair are out of phase. So those two are out of phase. So this is the first thing you need to know. Another thing is points within two consecutive nodes. are in phase. So any point in this region, because here is a null and here is a null, and they are consecutive, are in phase. And if I draw, I continue to draw this. Those two things are in phase as well. So this is um, some basic property of standing waves. So because X and Y, um, they are inside the region of two consecutive nodes, they are in phase, completely in phase. So the phase difference will be zero. A person wearing polarizing sunglasses stands at the edge of a pond, bright sunlight. Okay, so this is the angle theta. This is the surface of pond. The first surface of the pond is flat, and the line of set of the person make a angle theta with the surface. The refractive index of the pond water is n. What is the value of theta for which the intensity of the sunlight ref reflected by the surface to the person's eyes is minimum? So when the reflected light to the person's eyes is minimum, which means that the light is completely polarized. Completely polarized. And this reminds us with the Brewster's angle, the Brewster angle. Um, and for Brewster angle, standing at the, and I think this is air. This is air, which has a refractive index of one. Um, for the Brewster's angle, we know that tangent theta is equal to n, right? This is the um, this is the formula we have. If you want to prove it, you can also prove it. Um, in fact, let me do it so it doesn't look so confusing. So how we obtain this equation is by using the Snell law. So n air multiplied by sine theta is equal to n multiplied by sine the refractive angle of the pond. And we know for um, the Brewster's angle, there is a right angle between the reflected light and the refracted light. So here is the reflected light, which Oh, sorry, here is not theta. Here should actually be the angle of incidence. This is a serious mistake. I apologize for this. So this is the angle of incidence, and here has an equal angle. And here is the angle of refraction, theta sub p. And here you're going to have a right angle. So 
the refractive index of air is equal to 1. So this is equal to sine theta 1, which is equal to n multiplied by sine. So theta sub p is going to be equal to 19 degree minus theta 1. This is because we know something like this has an angle of 118, and here has a right angle. So um, if we minus by 19 degree, this is equal to 19 degree, which is equal to the sum of theta 1, sorry, not theta 1, um, angle of in incidence theta sub i. plus theta sub p. So theta sub p is going to be equal to uh, 19 degree minus theta sub i. And this is equal to n multiplied by cosine theta i. This is a trig formula. And then from this, we can know that tangent, tangent theta i is equal to n right and now let's look at the answer so we know b and c are not correct because when we think about the brewster angle it gotta be something linked to tangent and there are two different methods to solve this problem um the first one because you want to calculate the angle theta and this one that gives you the angle of 19 degree minus c sorry this one gives you the angle of incidence theta sub i so a is not correct so the only possible correct answer is d and the other way is you can actually solve the answer by using some mathematics so tangent sub theta is equal to sorry i constantly make verbal mistakes today um tangent and tangent sub theta sorry tangent theta sub i is equal to tangent 19 degree minus theta i and this is equal to sine 19 degree minus theta i over cosine 19 degree minus theta i and this is equal to cosine theta i divided by sine theta i which is equal to tangent theta i and this is equal to n so 1 over n is gonna be equal to sorry here is cotangent it's gonna be equal to tangent theta i and theta i will be equal to r tangent 1 over i which is equal to this thing here All right um so this is the answer for this problem um and by the way for hl students you are expected to know basic trigonometry and basic calculus for um, the IB physics HL, at least that's from my personal perspective. If you know some calculus and trigonometry, um, it will be easier to comprehend lots of concepts. The fundamental frequency of a particular uh, organ pipe is 330 hertz. The pipe is closed at one end. This is a key term, but open eye at the other. So close at one end and open at the other. Uh, what is the frequency of the next highest harmonic? So when the pipe is closed at one end, we know that wavelength is equal to uh, 4L divided by N. N is equal to 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on. So frequency will be equal to V multiplied by N divided by 4L. And for the first harmonic, n is equal to 1. So frequency is equal to v over 4l, which is equal to 330 hertz. And for the next highest harmonic, n is equal to 3. So
So this is going to be equal to a half. Sorry, not a half. One third multiply. Why one third? Three multiply. Three multiply by 330. Uh, and this is equal to 990 hertz. So D is the answer. Light travels from air into glass as shown. The refractive index of glasses. Um, for this one, you just need to apply the Snell law. So the angle to the normal, the angle between the light and the normal is equal to 60 degree. Uh, and the angle here is equal to 10 degree. So refractive index of air is equal to 1. So 1 multiplied by sine 60 degree is equal to N glass, refractive index of glass multiplied by sine 10 degree. So N sub G is equal to sine 60 degree divided by sine 10 degree. Um, so the answer will be C. Um, and this is the last problem of page 14. Two polarizing filters are set up, set up so the transmitted light is at a maximum intensity. Through which angle should polarizer 2 be rotated so that no light is transmitted? So assuming the initial intensity is I, when having maximum intensity, the transmitted light has an intensity of I, meaning that um, both polarizes, polarizers have um, parallel axis. Um, and for no light to transmit, it, it means that axes, axes are perpendicular, are perpendicular. So they gotta be rotated by an angle of 19 because cosine 19 degree is equal to zero. So the answer is C. Which diagram shows the shape of the waveform as a result of the diffraction of plane waves by an object? So when meeting an object, there got to be some discontinuity because wave cannot just directly pass through this object here. So we expect some discontinuity between this region. So C and D are not correct. Uh, and for refractive, sorry, not refractive, for diffraction, waves are something like this. Right. So the answer is A. Um, this is the last problem of page 15. We are halfway through the problems. A beam of unpolarized light is incident on the surface of a liquid and is partially reflected and partially refracted as shown below. The reflected light is completely, horiz completely horizontally polarized. Which of the following is a refractive index of the liquid? Um, if you know the equation for the Brewster's angle, you know that tangent 15 degree is going to be equal to uh, refractive index of the liquid divided by refractive index of air. So N sub 1 is equal to tangent 15 degree. Right? Um, so the equation for the Brewster angle. Let me write it in right, because this is very important. So the Brewster angle. This is the angle of incidence. This is also the angle of incidence. This is the refracted light, which is 
not that important and this is right angle 19 degree um the medium here is n1 the medium here is n2 so tangent theta sub i is gonna be equal to n sub 2 divided by n sub 1 this is like the formula for the Brewster's angle and you can prove this uh, by using trigonometry and i have showed this type up in the previous part of the video um and this is the last problem of page 16. Wave generators play at position P and position Q produce water waves of wavelength 4.0 cm. Each generator operating along produces a wave oscillating with amplitude A at position R. Distance PR and QR are shown in the figure below. Both wave generators now cooperate together in phase. Uh, what's the amplitude of the oscillation? of the resulting wave at r so we know that wavelength is equal to 4.0 centimeter and to know the net displacement sorry not net amplitude at wave the wave has at point r we need to think about whether um the path different is in phase or out of phase to obtain the answer for this problem so the path difference is equal to 20 centimeter minus 14 centimeter which is equal to 6 centimeter and we know that wavelength is equal to 4.0 centimeter so 6 centimeter divided by 4 centimeter is equal to 1.5 1.5 this tell us that the past difference is equal to 1.5 wavelengths which is equal to one plus a half wavelengths and from this we can see that at point r um the two waves are out of phase right um and when out of phase amplitude is equal to zero so the answer will be A. Um, just a reminder of when waves are in phase, they have a path difference of lambda multiplied by R. And when waves are out of phase, they have a path difference of N plus a half multiply by lambda and it does make sense because a half lambda means two waves are like this so they're out of phase and n is equal to one two uh, zero one two three four five and so on so n belongs to all integer and this is just a quick recap a liquid in youtube is giving a initial displacement and a law to oscillate the motion of the liquid is recorded using a motion sensor, which graph shows a variation with time t of the velocity v of the liquid. Um, so when we are looking at this problem, we know that a and d are definitely going to be wrong because they're supposed to be simple harmonic motion, um, not necessarily simple harmonic motion because damp oscillation occur, but we know that there are going to be some oscillations. Right, oscillations so a and b are definitely wrong and then we have um, c and d so c is a simple harmonic motion which means that the restoring force is directly proportional to the distance from an object travels from the equilibrium position 
and this is what we call a dump os dumped oscillation. And for a short student, you will learn this topic in topic nine. And for this problem, um, it might it might be a little bit hard to understand right now if you don't know dump oscillation. Um, but the answer is D. This is because um, when the null object travel in liquid, I, I'm just gonna say this is water. Um, it has a weight. Uh, assuming it's traveled downward, it also experiences buoyancy. At the same time, it experiences a drag force. And drag force is very similar to air resistance, is a frictional force. Is a frictional force um, that point opposite to the object's motion direction. So it's very similar to air resistance we talk about. And it is very similar to um, when we are doing an object on a inclined plane, we say that there is a friction. So uh, drug force basically is the friction exerted by the liquid in this problem. So because of friction force, it causes energy dissipation. Right, it causes energy dissipation or energy loss. And we know that energy is directly proportional to amplitude squared. So when energy um, is dissipated, it means that amplitude is reduced. And this um, tells us why D is the answer. And you can, this graph can also be mathematically modeled. You can look at this topic if you are interested in it. Um, and this is the last problem of page 17. Light is diffracted at a single slit. Which of the following best represents how the intensity I of the diffracted light varies with the diffraction angle theta? Mm. So when I look at this problem, I, th I, I know D is wrong um, and C is the answer. Um, so for this topic, you need to be familiar with different type of um, diffraction, uh, such as double slits, uh, single slits, and also multiple slits. And you need to be familiar with their graphs. So A shows the interference pattern. And you can know this because interfering pattern, they sort of show um, constant amplitude, while intensity, um, their amplitude varies. And B looks like a multiple slits diffraction. And you can tell this because they have really sharp peak for intensity. Um, so as the number of slits increases, the amount of light that can pass through slits increases. This increases intensity. Um, that's the reason why they have a very sharp peak in this graph. And C represents the uh, intensity versus theta for single slits. Um, when I was learning this topic, uh, I think a important distinction that we need to make is the is the difference between diffraction and interference. So I look at the definition from study.com. It says diffraction describe the spreading uh, describe the spreading out of light waves as it moves around an obstacle or through a aperture or gap. And this causes diffraction pattern. Um, refraction is the bending of light as it passes from one medium to another medium. The path of the light in this case depends on the density of material. So the last sentence is saying that angle um, depends on 
uh, depends on refraction index and refraction index is directly linked to the nature of material. And this is a picture for double slits. And this is from OpenStack. Um, so here it shows you how diffraction patterns and interference are different from each other. So this is for a double slit. This is a interference pattern. And this is um, the diffraction pattern. So you have a wave passing through, which causes diffraction pattern. And then together, they form this image, the red image here. And this is the thing we see intensely, right? Oh, by the way, uh, I just want to point out that for single slits, the fringe spacing for, uh, between till central minimum is twice the distance between the fringe spacing between other minimum uh, between other two consecutive minimums. Polarized light of intensity I sub zero is incident on a polarizing filter. The angle between the plane of polarization of the incident light and the transmission plane of the polarizer is theta. Which graph show how the intensity I of light transmitted through the polarizer varies with theta? Oh, so how can we do this? Oh, A and D are definitely not correct because we know intensity, they have a cosine here. And cosine is a trig function, so it's not going to be linear. So A and B are wrong. So for this type of problem, the best way I recommend is to think about special angle. So cosine 19 degree is equal to zero cosine zero degree is equal to one. And this is the minimum intensity. And this is the maximum intensity. So trying to find special trig values. So here um, it produces a minimum intensity at cosine zero degree, which is one. Um, here, when angle is equal to zero, intensity is maximum. When angle is in 19 degree, uh, minimum intensity occurs. So D is the correct answer. And this is the last problem on page 20. Plant polarized light is incident normally on a polarizer, which is able to rotate the uh, rotates in the plane perpendicular to the light as shown. In diagram one, the intensity of the incident light is eight watts per meter square, and the transmitted light a uh, transmitted intensity of light is two watts per meter square. Diagram two shows the polarizer rotated nineteen degrees from the orientation in diagram one. What is the new transmitted intensity? Um, so the first thing we see is that is polarized. The light is polarized. This tells us final intensity is equal to initial intensity multiplied by cosine theta, where theta is the angle um, between the, uh, the light incident on the polarizer and the polarizer's axis. So we know the initial intensity here. We know the transmitted intensity, so we can calculate the value of um, cosine theta, and then we can calculate cosine theta. Oh, sorry, we can calculate theta. So, two the final intensity. Let me rewrite the equation. Let me write down the equation. So two is the transmitted intensity. The in initial intensity is equal to eight, and then we have angle here. This tells us that cosine square theta is equal to uh, 2 divided by 8, which is equal to 1 over 4. So cosine theta is going to be equal to a half. Uh, 
so theta is equal to this um so you use the inverse function which is equal to 16 degree right is equal to 16 degree and now it tell us that the um, uh, the polarizer is rotated 19 degree so now the angle is equal to 19 degree plus 16 degree so the final intensity is equal to um, a multiplied by cosine uh, cosine square theta cosine theta square and theta is equal to 19 degree plus 16 degree uh, so I'm gonna use the property that cosine pi over 2 plus x is equal to negative sine x. And because we are squaring this, so we are gonna ignore the negative sign. So this is equal to cosine sine square 16. And sine 16 is equal to um, the square root of 3 over 2. So this is equal to a multiply by 3 over 4, which is 6 watt per meter square. So the answer is C. Um, I just want to say that for topic 4, even if you are not like a math HL student, it, it will be super helpful if you can remember special trig values uh, for cosine sign tangent you don't have to know so zero degree 30 degrees 45 degree 60 degree and 180 degree so cosine zero is equal to one um cosine 13 is equal to the square root of three over two uh, the square root of two over two a half and one sine 0 is equal to 0 and then a half the square root of 2 over 2 the square of th the square root of 3 over 2 and then 1 so try to know those values so you can um, solve those questions confidently A point source of sun is placed behind a soundproof barrier as shown in the diagram. Okay. From where uh, Yon, whatever, E is standing, uh, from, from where E is standing, he can hear the song. Which of the following best describe this observation? Um, so the reason why he can, this thing here, can hear song is because the point source after light waves is passes through this because the spreading of waves so here you have a barrier so it's gonna be something like this okay you're gonna have some discontinuity here and the spreading of wave is defined as diffraction so a is the answer. Uh, again, interference refers to the process. Uh, sorry, diffraction refers to the spreading of um, the spreading of waves, and this causes interference, such as dest disruptive and constructive interference. But diffraction is the reason why a person can hear a song. A string vibrates with fundamental frequency f. Uh, the wavelength of the sound produced in air is lambda. Which of the following correctly gives the frequency of vibration on the force harmonic of the spring and the wavelength of the sound in air? Um, so for this problem, there are different ways of solving it. Um, if you for for those people who do not know that guitar sorry a string
is a transverse or longitudinal. If you don't know uh, if it is a transverse or longitudinal wave. The best way to think about it is that because it still travel in travels in air, velocity remain on change. So velocity remains unchanged. This tells us that the product of frequency multiplied by lambda should always equal to v. And from this, you can uh, directly obtain the answer. So frequency, um, this doesn't produce v because both quantities are reduced. And this is also wrong because both quantities are enlarged. Um, this is wrong because frequency is divided by 2, while wavelength is multiplied by 4. So the final product will still be multiplied by 2. And d is the answer because 4 multiplied by 1 over 4 cancels out. So this is the first way of solving it. The second way is to think about um, how can we do this problem. So a spring vibrates with a fundamental frequency f. The wavelength of the sound produced in air is lambda. Which of the following correctly go gives the frequency on the fourth harmonic? So when I see fourth harmonic, I think about this equation or this one. And because it's a string, is fixed on both ends. So I'm going to use this equation here, right? So when n is equal to 1, is equal to f, sorry. When, when n is equal to 1, um, frequency, uh, sorry, wavelength is equal to lambda. And frequency is equal to v over 2l is equal to f. When n is equal to 4, Lambda is equal to 2L divided by 4. And this is equal to lambda over 4. And frequency is equal to velocity divided by 2L multiplied by 4, which is equal to 4F. And this will give you the same answer as D. Um... This is page 22. Two polarizers have polarizing axes that make an angle of 30 degree to each other. On polarized line of intensity, I sub 1 is incident on the fourth polarizer, so the line of intensity I sub 2 emerges from the second polarizer, as shown below. Given the value of cosine 13, what's the ratio of I sub 1 over I sub 2? Um, so because this is on polarized light, I1 is on polarized light of intensity I sub 1. Um, here the intensity is going to be equal to a half multiplied by I sub 1. For all on polarized light, um, the final intensity after passing through a polarizer will be equal to um, a half of its initial intensity regardless of the the, the polarizing axis. So do remember this for on a polarized light. After passing through a polarizer, their intensity is going to be equal to a half multiplied by its initial intensity. So here will be a half I1. 
and then we need to calculate um, final intensity I sub 2. So after passing through the first polarizer, the light will be polarized. So final intensity is going to be equal to a half I sub 1 multiplied by the angle between polar the polarizing axis and the light. And we know that the angle is 13 degree. Because it tells us polarizing axis makes a angle of 13 degree to each other. So it's going to be equal to a half I1 multiplied by um, cosine 13 degree squared. And we know the value of cosine 13. So it's going to be equal to a half I multiply by 3 over 2, which is equal to um, 3 over 4 multiplied by I1. Oh, I think I made a mistake here. Here should be 8 because here is 4. Yeah, this is 4 and this is 8. And this is equal to I2. So I1 over I2 is going to be equal to I1 over 3 over 8 I1. This is equal to 8 over 3. So the answer is D. A stationary point, a stationary wave is set up on a stretch string. The diagram below shows how the string has three different instances of time, P, Q, and R, um, are three points on the position. Which of the following gives two points on the string that are in phase and two points on the string that are one wavelength apart? Mm. One wavelength apart and, um, and are in phase. So when points are wavelength, one wavelength apart, they are in phase. So let's look at the answer. I'm going to start with this first because it's easier to identify. PQ and PR. Um, PQ and PR, you can see that is lambda over 2. And PR is lambda. Um, so C and D are wrong. And because when points are... When points are one lambda away, they're in phase. So the answer is B. Another way to think about is going back to the concept of standing wave. We talk about that um, two consecutive pair for a, for a standing wave um, are out of phase, right? So something like this. They're out of phase. The two consecutive pair, out of phase. However, for those two, they're in phase. So when we see the graph, you should immediately know that P, Q are out of phase. And P, R are in phase. And this will also give you the answer B. Gas particles are equally spaced along a straight line. A sound wave passes through the gas. The positions of the gas particles at one instance are shown below. Which of the distance shown is equal to the wavelength of the wave? Mm, so wavelength, wavelength is equal to the distance. Uh, for for sound wave wavelength is equal to the distance between two consecutive um two consecutive center of compression or refraction. So you just need to identify the center of compression or refraction. So here is a center of compression, and here is another center of refraction. So B is equal to wavelength. Right. And if you want to draw a graph, 
of displacement versus time. Here will be a center of compression, which are one lambda away, because here are positive direction, region above um, the x axis, uh, the horizontal axis has a positive direction, so travel to the right direction, and below the horizontal direction have a negative displacement, so travel to the left direction, which form a center of compression, and here is refraction. A wave pose is sent along a line string, um, which is attached to a heavy rope as shown. The diagram are now drawn to scale, scale, which diagram shows the shape of the string and the rope after a short time. So when traveling from a light string to a heavy string, when the pose goes back, it's going to be inverted. So it's going to be inverted, and inverted um, means reflected upside down, reflected vertically, or reflected, reflected around the axis. So initially it's something like this, after inverted it will look something like this when it goes back. So A is wrong, C is wrong. And when going to the heavy rope, it gonna re direction remains unchanged. So the answer is B. Um, so this is going to a light to heavy pose is inverted. And when going from a heavy string to a light string pose is reflected. Reflected means left and right. For instance, assuming this is the original shape of the pose when traveling from a heavy string to a light string, then after reflected, it looks something like this. And this is the last problem of page 25. On polarized light of intensity I sub zero is incident on a polarizer that has a vertical transmission axis. The polarizer is rotated by angle theta to the direction of the incident light. The intensity of the transmitter light um, is I, which graph shows the variation with the angle theta to the ratio of I over I sub zero. Mm. So again, think about special trick value. Um, cosine theta is equal to one, so maximum intensity. Cosine 19 degree is equal to zero, right? And graph of their written in term of pi. So uh, 19 degree is equal to cosine pi over 2. This is wrong because it's not going to be constant as theta changes. Um, this is also wrong because when having 0 0.5, it means that theta is equal to 45 degree only. Is this 45 degree? I think it's 45. Uh, for cosine 45 is equal to um, the square root of 2 over 2. And when squaring it, it is equal to 2 over 4, 1 over 2. So yeah, C is equal to 45 degree. And for C, when angle is equal to 0, it's supposed to have maximum intensity. And when equal to pi, it's supposed to have um, minimum intensity. So this is wrong. D is correct because when zero maximum intensity, 
uh, pi over 2 minimum intensity, 118 maximum intensity. So it means that the axes are being rotated. Um, so cosine 118 degree is equal to negative 1. When you square it, it's equal to 1. Um, polarized light is incident on a polarizer. The light transmitted by the first polarizer is an incident on a second polarizer. The polarizing axis uh, of the second polarizer is 60 degree to the first polarizer. The, Im the intensity emerging from the second polarizer is I sub F. Find the ratio. Oh, sorry, intensity incident on the first polarizer. So, how do we do this? So, let's look at this. What which of following correctly gives the intensity incident on the first polarizer? Oh, well, so, so you need to think about IF. So, assuming initial intensity is i and because it's unpolarized so after going through the first polarizer the intensity is equal to a half i and after the light going through the first polarizer is polarized so i f is gonna be equal to a half multiply cosine square theta uh, where theta is the angle here the angle between the polarized light and the polarizer's polarizing axis and this is equal to a half so cosine 16 degree is equal to 1 over 2 and when you square it is equal to 1 over 4 so this is equal to 1 over 8 I. I forgot to write a I here. So I F is equal to 1 over 8 I. So I is equal to 8 I F, which is D. Again, you are expected to know special trick values when for IB physics, especially if you are a HL student. A string is made to vibrate at its third harmonic. The diagram shows two point P and Q at a particular instant in time. Which of the following compares the period of vibration P and Q on the and the average speed of P and Q? So this is a standing wave so this is a standing wave so a period of vibration um the period of vibration of a standing wave is same and be but because their amplitude is different their speed will also be different so the answer is b And another way to think about this is because each point they have um, a different amplitude, um, their velocity is different, um, so it will also be B. And this is the end of page 28. The diagram sh um, the diagrams show the variation with time t of the displacement y of a particle of a medium through which a wave travels. Which diagram correctly shows the period t and the amplitude a of the wave? So um, I will just go through the answer. The answer is c. So amplitude refers to the difference between um, 
a cross or a trough um, to the midline. So it refers to the distance between this point to this middle line or this point to this middle line. So only A, B, C. Sorry, what am I doing? C is not correct. Okay. Oh, sorry. I mean, A is the answer. So only A and B are correct. And D refer to um, the amount of time you need to travel one complete wavelength. And wavelength refer to the distance between um, two consecutive waves, two consecutive cross or two consecutive trough. So C, A is the correct answer because here it only travel um, 0 0.5 wavelengths. P and Q are two point on a standing wave, R and S are two point on a progressive wave. Which of following give the relationship between amplitude of each pair of points? So comparing standing wave uh, with traveling wave, this is a also a type of commonly tested problem for topic four. Um, so we know that for standing wave, they have different amplitude. This is because um, standing waves are formed by adding two waves tra traveling in the opposite direction and but same frequency and they're add up according to the law of superposition so their net displacement is different and for point p and s because it's a traveling wave they're gonna have some same amplitude so the answer is b on polarized light of intensity, I sub zero is transmitted through a polarizer, which has a transmission axis at an angle theta to the vertical. The light is then incident on a second polarizer with transmission axis at an angle theta to the transmission axis of the first polari polarizer, as shown below. Um, the intensity of the light that emerges from the second polarizer is I. What is the ratio of I over I sub zero? Um, so the initial intensity is I sub zero, let's assume, because it's unpolarized after passing through the first polarizer, it will be equal to a half I sub zero. And then here, it's going to be equal to a half I sub zero multiplied by cosine phi, uh, and then you square this trig quantity here. So I over I sub zero is equal to i over a half i cosine squared phi. This is equal to um, i, this is equal to one over a half. i sub zero or, oh sorry, I think Sorry, I, I think I did it in the opposite way. Um, so I was finding I sub zero over I. This is asking us about I over I sub zero. So it's equal to a half I sub zero cosine um, squared phase. This is equal to the final intensity I and over the initial intensity and I sub zero cancel saw. So it's gonna be equal to a half cosine square phi so c is the answer monochromatic coherent light is incident on a narrow rectangular slit the diffracted light is observed on a distant screen the graph below shows how the intensity of the light varies with position on the screen the, the width of the slit is reduced which graph shows how the intensity of light observed varies with the position on the screen? The original diffraction pattern is shown with a dotted line. Um, so here are four choices. Mm. So when the width of the slit is reduced, it means that less light can pass through. And because the amount of light that pass, passes through the slit 
decreases, um, this leads to a decrease in intensity. So intensity is reduced. And because intensity is plotted on the y-axis, a reduction in intensity leads to a reduction in peak value. So peak value is reduced. This tells us A and D are wrong. So let's look at C and D. So from C, you see that the distance between um, the two central minimum is greater than this distance here. This tells us when the slit um, width increases, sorry, decreases, fringe spacing between two central minimum is decreased. Sorry. So when slit width decreases, fringe spacing decreases. And this sort of show a increase. It's not very obvious. Um, so which one is the correct answer? Um, so assuming this is the slit width, right? Uh, and this is the central minimum, two central minimum. And the frame spacing here, I'm going to call half of the distance y. And then I'm going to draw an angle. This is the angle theta. This is the distance um, between the screen and the point source, d. So d tangent theta is equal to y. And because theta is very small, I'm going to approximate this into d theta is equal to y. Or d sine theta is equal to y. d sine theta is a more accurate, definitely. So let me write d sine theta. And we know that path difference. So if you want to know this, you can sort of draw two line, delta L. Delta L is equal to A sine theta. So there's going to be another um, right triangle. And here is going to equal to theta. is equal to the path difference. This tells us, oh, this is how we can calculate sine theta. And we want to do this in terms of uh, frequency, sorry, wavelength. So path difference is equal to m multiplied by lambda. Uh, and I'm, m is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 for destructive interference for single slit diffraction. So sine theta is going to be equal to lambda divided by a. And I am setting m equal to 1 because we are calculating the central minimum. And now I can plug this in. So y is going to be equal to d lambda divided by a. So when a is reduced, we expect an increase in y. So c is wrong. So c is wrong. And d is the answer for this problem. This is a hard problem. Uh, I think 70% of candidates chose A and B, A or B, according to the report.